Greetings on this mid-September morning for us here in Minnesota. Glad that you could be with us today. We're going to kick off our monthly utilization-focused webinar. Um, I'm Charmaine Campbell-Patton and joined by my dad and colleague, Michael Quinn Patton. And I know many of you have been joining us every month, so I'm glad to have you back. For those who are new, welcome. We have been digging into a different principle of utilization-focused evaluation every month. And this month, we're looking at principle six, which is engage users. But before we get started, I just want to ground us um, with a land acknowledgement and just a recognition of where we're at in the world. So here, um, it's the eve of the fall equinox here in the Northern Hemisphere. And just wanna take a moment um, to recognize that equ uh, equinox comes from the Latin word equi, which means equal and nox night. And so this is a way to kind of connect us globally. The days and the nights are of almost equal length around the world. And, um, in Greek mythology, this was the, the, the September equinox marks the time um, when the goddess Persephone returned to the darkness of the underworld, and she is reunited with her husband Hades, and this is the basis of the musical Hades Town, which happens to be one of Michael's favorites, and so I just wanted to recognize that <laughs> as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and... We also want to acknowledge we are coming to you from Minnesota, as I said, which is Dakota land and Anishinaabe territory. And Michael and I are settlers on this land. Our ancestors came to what became the United States from Ireland, England, and Scotland. And they participated in and benefited from attempted genocide of Native people and enslavement of Sub-Saharan Africans. And despite centuries of colonial theft and violence, we know this is still Indigenous land, and it will always be. And we have a responsibility to interrupt the generational legacies that are, um, have come before us and that continue to this day. And so we uh, acknowledge the land we are on as well as commit to redistribute the royalties from the fifth edition of UFE to uh, a couple of organizations. Dakota Iapi is a um, land revitalization organization that's local here. And the Indigenous Environmental Network is a global organization working for environmental justice. So with that, uh, I invite you, if you'd like, to um, introduce yourself in the chat if you haven't and tell us what land you are joining us from, where you are coming to us from today. And we'll move on to our main event, which is looking at utilization-focused evaluation. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, the overarching principle of utilization-focused evaluation is to focus on intended use by and with intended users in every aspect of and at every stage of an evaluation. And then there are 10 operating principles, and we've gone through the first five in our previous webinars, and today we are looking at the sixth. This is a lot, so we're just going to focus on the sixth today, which is be active, reactive, interactive, and adaptive in working with and engaging intended users. And really, this is all about how you're engaging and facilitating evaluation. The key premises of this principle are that working with intended users requires facilitation skills. So beyond some of the traditional evaluation skills that we are often hearing about, um, trusting interpersonal relationships enhance meaningful and authentic engagement. And that this is a dynamic process that involves being active, interactive, reactive, and adaptive. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and what that looks like during this webinar today. And just to make the connection kind of between what we've talked about before and this principle, we started with the situation analysis, where we then identified intended, primary intended users within that situation analysis and engaged those users in identifying the evaluation focus, the questions, the methods, interpretation, and application of findings, all towards this goal that evaluation is relevant, credible, meaningful, and useful. 
this shows a linear process. It's not linear. It goes back and forth. You continue to identify primary intended users and engage in situation analysis. This is sort of the simplified version. And adaptive, reactive, interactive, and adaptive evaluation facilitation undergirds all of that. That is how you're able to get this, um, do these other activities. Do you want to hand it over to Michael with that grounding to see if you want to add anything at this point? Thank you, Charmaine, and welcome everyone. Part of what the this particular principle highlights is the uh, making the interactions with intended users um, a meaningful process to them. And so, um, what uh, what happens with we find with a, a lot of evaluations, the evaluator's engagement with the stakeholders is primarily talking at them, uh, telling them what's going to happen, giving them information, uh, keeping them informed of the evaluation, but not really an interactive process and an engagement process. And the psychology of use that undergirds utilization-focused evaluation is that people are more likely to use something that they feel involved in, ownership of, and that they fully understand by having been a part of the process. So this is uh, aimed at helping the intended users uh, get that ownership, feel involved, uh, understand what's, what's going on, and make it a two-way communication. And we'll describe that two-way communication around this language of active, reactive, interactive, and adaptive, and what that means. But it it is a two-way flow rather than a one-way uh, kind of communication. Go ahead, Charmaine. Yeah. So in the book, we offer a table that compares traditional facilitation guidance and evaluation facilitation. And I'm actually going to go ahead and share that. Um, with you in the chat, if I can pull it up for you, this is the um, table from the butt. So hopefully you can download that for yourself. And this is just one of them. Um, this kind of shows the difference between traditional facilitation, where you're ensuring both quality of interactions and achieving expected outcomes. This is a facilitation kind of tightrope that you're walking between these two things, paying attention to the importance of both of them. And when we look at evaluation facilitation, you've got evaluative thinking and capacity building as two of your primary tools for helping you make that balancing act. And so that's just one of the ways that we sort of, in the book, talk through some of the traditional facilitation advice and add and layer on top of it utilization-focused evaluation to that. Do you want to say any more about this one or any of the other examples? Uh, just that this is also then the evaluative thinking capacity building is, is related to the principle on process use, which is that we're in utilization focused evaluation, always thinking about both the immediate evaluation that's being done, but building the capacity of uh, the, those involved to engage in evaluation long time, long term. And so you'll see that the principle we're gonna talk about next time, strategizing process use number seven, follows from engaging users. The things that people get out of being involved in the process, the value to them of learning evaluative thinking, of building their capacity comes from this active engagement. So this is just a visual of these, um this facilitation cycle, act, react, interact, and adapt. And we're just gonna go through some tips to help you um, when you're thinking about how to do this. Um, so the first tip we offer is to customize. So really this isn't about just having your recipe out and going through what you do the same way every time in every situation. But it's really about immersing yourself in the challenges of the situation and having more of a rather than, you know, one 
tool, having more of a Swiss army knife or a toolbox or a toy box or whatever metaphor you want to use that you can pull from to customize your facilitation process and your evaluation design um, to that situation. So it's really about um, getting comfortable yourself as an evaluation facilitator to know kind of what those tools are and staying up to date on what new tools are emerging rather than always imposing the same tool in every context. And these five domains that are listed here are the, the five domains of competence that the American Evaluation Association has um, endorsed. And so uh, uh, what, you're, what you're seeing here and how it had to do with engaging users is that in order to customize, you have to be able to interact with the users to know what's important to them, what they uh, bring to the evaluation what their existing capacity is, what their interests are, what the context is. Um, and that upfront time uh, is the interpersonal part that builds the capacity then to make decisions together around things like methods. The second tip is to facilitate high quality interactions among primary intended users sort of, um, again, to that interpersonal domain, really thinking about being sensitive to how much time you're asking for from the people who are involved um, and balancing the quantity and timing and quality with the real focus on quality. So really thinking about um, not just meeting more times so that people, you know, have more touch points, but that, um, really thinking about when you're meeting, timing those interactions to important decision-making um, timeframes or you know when certain data might be available, as well as really thinking about how, paying more attention to the how you're interacting with those users and how they're interacting with one another. Um, and so really thinking about that careful, that careful, planning of how you're engaging users, which we talked about some in principle too, or on focus on use, is really um, thinking about reducing the, the amount of time and really thinking more about the quality of time. And, and part of what is involved in both of these first two tips is how you select the options that you provide to intended users. The active reactive, interactive, adaptive part begins with active. The active role of the evaluator is to present options, uh, to narrow down based on the situation analysis and the knowing the intended users, narrow it down to the key decision points, pathways, options that they need to, to choose among. Uh, and that, that the, the quality then is based upon making it clear that these are really decisions that are around use and intended use, the purpose of the evaluation, you know, of doing, it's, it's easy, for example, uh, I found when you, people bring the expectation of a midterm and an end of project evaluation, because that's what they've experienced before, and that that's going to be the, the timing. But if you back off of, of that, as we've talked about uh, before, and say, when are decisions being taken about how the program is going to unfold? What's the timing of those decisions? Um, and what kind of evidence would support those decisions? It's uh, rare in my experience that those decisions happen at midterm, that there's something that's boilerplate to put into a contract that we're going to, to do a check-in at the middle of a project or program, but that's not where the actual decisions are likely to get taken, nor are they taken at the end. Decisions have to get taken before the end. So you're getting into the quality of not surface decisions, not the surface kind of midterm end of, but getting people to think about what is the actual timing of decision-making 
an action in this particular situation so that they're getting a sense that you're really tying the evaluation to the program decision-making cycle and budgeting cycle. One of the major reasons evaluations don't get used is that the, the flow of the evaluation is not connected to program decision-making or budget cycles. And so being sure that that quality of interaction is taking place increases use. The other thing that I find really helpful is to really think about those um, primary intended users who are really excited and interested in being engaged more ongoing. And then those who are a little bit more like, we just want to know like what we need to know. And so, and really thinking about engaging them differently, right? There may be a core group that's like really wanting to be much more deeply involved and they're going to you know, meet more regularly and then you sort of work with them to figure out who needs to be involved at other times so that you're not asking everyone to come to every meeting about the evaluation and that you're more strategic about different levels of engagement, which we talked about previously as well. The next is nurture interest and develop capacity to engage in evaluation. And um, this is really about kind of what I was just talking about, thinking about where different folks are at in their in interest levels in evaluation and thinking about, you know, those folks who really are eager to learn and do more to work with them a little bit more closely, um, as well as make sure that you're bringing others who are important uh, primary intended users along, but not necessarily having everyone needing to do everything, but really thinking about how are you connecting the evaluation to what's important to the primary intended users and helping them see and understand how it will be valuable to them and continuing that process as you go along so that you, know, you may have the folks who are really deeply involved in using the evaluation regularly and others who just need to know certain, certain aspects of it and bring those in when that's important. Do you wanna say, give an example or say more about this, Michael? Well, part of what I find, uh, this relates to the process use piece, is as issues come up in the evaluation, uh, is, is helping connect the particular issue uh, at the moment, like the purpose of the evaluation, to the larger field of evaluation. Uh, that these are generic kind of issues that come up, and that's helping prepare people to understand evaluation uh, in the longer term uh, to understand evaluative thinking. And so you know, helping people make the connection between the specific and the more general uh, evaluation issues uh, is, is often very important. So for example, um, a, a, a common thing that uh, we run into is that because people are expecting to um, have to come up with methods and measures and they're, they may have had some anxiety about that. What are we gonna measure? What are the, the actual tools going to be um, that folks expect to get into that right away? And it becomes important to, to make the point that the tools, methods and measures flow from the questions. So we don't begin with the methods. We really begin with spending time on questions and the questions come from purpose. And having to go back through, not just one time, but reminding people of the flow and why then the questions take on so much more importance and, the, and, and running the scenarios of if you got answers to those questions, what would you do to be able to help people understand the logic of evaluation, uh, not just dealing with that particular issue in that moment then, but helping connect it to the larger frame of how an evaluation unfolds. The next tip is to value diversity and really encourage diverse perspectives and guide the group of primary intended users in really seeking out those different perspectives. So this can come from racial or ethnic or cultural backgrounds, identities, ages, experiences with the program. So participant, funder, um, and this really helps to deepen a 
broader understanding of the system and the different experiences within that system and for a specific program, as well as different ways of thinking about things. And, you know, when everyone easily agrees with something, it's hard to really get deeper into what's happening and probing assumptions. And so engaging different perspectives really helps to deepen the thinking and the evaluative thinking. Um, but it also really requires that the facilitator be prepared to address potential power dynamics and um, addressing those and really ensuring that those who maybe traditionally hold less power or you know are, have their viewpoints have not been as prioritized, but they have a place and a voice and making space for that. And so, um, well, we discussed that this a little bit um, further down the line, but just really keeping in mind the way that you bring different perspectives together will really enhance the evaluation process. And it is a facilitation skill to be able to ensure that those different perspectives are being heard and valued in the process. Uh, a, a basic principle of facilitation is diverge and then converge, that to get a, a variety of options out on the table and understanding what each of those involves before converging. Uh, this requires the facilitator to have comfort with the process that you can move to convergence, you can come to an agreement uh, uh, and the people will understand where that agreement has come from with greater trust if you've begun with a, a diverse set of perspectives and with options. And that gives them the sense that they really are choosing something. And depending on what the you know topic you're addressing is, one of the things that um, is important to pay attention to as a facilitator is your own identity and how that impacts the group and the potential need for co-facilitator, you know, as a white evaluator, if I'm working with a diverse group, having a co-facilitator, you know, who has a different identity, a BIPOC facilitator who could potentially caucus with BIPOC participants while I caucus with the white participants, if there's a particularly important like racial dynamic happening, making space to make sure that those participants who you know, are underrepresented or who have the power dynamics are not in their favor, have a place where they can feel safe engaging. So that's just something to keep in mind. There are lots of different tools for that. Um, and so as you're developing your facilitation tools, also think about your co-facilitation um, portfolio and who you can connect with to support that. The next is to stay focused on use. So this is really, um, obviously we've talked about this every every webinar because this is the crux of the um, utilization focused evaluation approach. But when you think about facilitation, it can be a really powerful tool when participants kind of start going off on tangents or start kind of, you start losing the thread that you bring it back to use. And, really emphasizing that nobody wants to be doing the evaluation just for the sake of the evaluation, um, that really we want this to be useful for them. And that if that's not happening, we need to bring it back and really refocus on what is gonna be the most useful. And so the facilitator is not only providing the direction and how to achieve the group's results, but also really helping the group see the value of those results and care about that by really bringing it back to how they're going to use those results to make, you know, to make their work better and to make their um, program better. And so really, you can't go wrong with this. Very few people have ever said that they are not in support of having the evaluation be used. So it can really be a strong anchor. Um, they might disagree about what is useful. Um, and so that is really help that can kind of elevate and return to that principle of focusing on use is really, okay, well, we need to kind of return to what the use is if we have disagreement about what that is at this point. Um, but it really helps us recenter on why we're doing this work. And so um, our job as facilitators is really to keep bringing that back as we see it potentially kind of getting lost in the fray of methods, discussion of methods and best practices and things like that is to always bring it back to use. 
Yeah, it's a, it's it's a always surprised me how challenging this can be. It sounds straightforward, but evaluation comes with so much baggage and so much compliance uh, mentality to it that people will uh, get distracted by making the report the focus. What what's the report going to be? Um, and and think that the report is what amounts to use. So that that uh, keeping that focus on use, I find that it often becomes a uh, a joke. Is oh, we're going on about use again. But it's a it's a it's a pretty big shift in systems where people have gotten used to evaluation just being paperwork, a compliance activity, reporting, um, and not actually useful. Despite the, what's interesting is the cognitive dissonance of people know that we talk about things being useful, but they don't really believe that that's going to happen. So there's a narrative mind shift to show a commitment and to keep looking at each stage of how that supports use, whatever decisions, purpose, questions, methods, analysis, that what's underpinning that uh, in the active, reactive, interactive, adaptive process is use. The next step is to use the evaluation standards as a facilitation framework. So you can start by giving users a copy of the evaluation criteria um, formulated by the Joint Committee on Evaluation Standards and really walk them through how that will show up. So thinking about utility questions, what factors can enhance use? What, ba what barriers might there be? Feasibility, what practical issues need to be addressed in the evaluation? Um, thinking about dealing with them in data gathering, access to program participants, those different feasibility issues about how to implement the evaluation. Propriet propriety questions, so ethics, what ethical issues need to be addressed? Um, who will have access to data? How will you handle um, participation, confidentiality, accuracy questions. So really thinking about comparison of methods, options, their implications, costs, validity, thinking about who, um, you know, who needs to see these as valid, reliable, reliable, and their utility, and making, what are you going to compare this to and making judgments about how well the program is doing? And then finally, accountability. What other criteria are important? to ensure a high quality and useful evaluation. Most of the groups that we work with don't know that there are evaluation standards and that you know this has been something that's been set out by the um, profession. And so putting that front and center and making sure that they understand that there's something really underlying this um, that's holding you to these standards and that the whole group can be held to these standards is a valuable tool to kind of keep the group on track. And, and the different evaluation associations around the world have their own variations. Uh, some of them have adopted and adapted to joint committee standards, or they have other standards that they've adopted, the African Evaluation Association, European Society, Australasian, um, New Zealand, the Latin American Network, uh, the Asian Conference. So uh, uh, knowing what's appropriate in your own context and bringing those uh, to the fore is part of what helps make the connection with intended users. And then the last tip is to facilitate both process and outcomes. This graphic, again, really thinking about how you're attending to the balancing act between the group process and the completion of the tasks at hand and using evaluative thinking and capacity building to support that. So we've already talked about this. Anything you wanted to add to that? Just that, that one of the fundamental facilitation principles is to what's called to go slow to go fast. And the go slow is the building of relationships, is people coming to know each other's interests. Um, and that go slow to go fast means that, that that upfront time that you spend in building mutual understanding and trust pays off in rapid decision-making later on. But getting too task-focused too early um, will often lead to conflicts where you have to try to make up the process issues 
later on. So the I find that that uh, many evaluators feel a pressure to get the it right into the method decisions again because that's what people expect, um, and that 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 pressure both that they feel to know what methods are going to be used and that the intended users work with leads them to short circuit the process questions uh, really about purpose and questions and use itself. So go slow to go fast, pin the time up front in quality interactions that will help the later decisions about methods and in analysis and interpretation. So we have an example in the book that we talk about where we were co-facilitating um, a group of folks from a regional government agency who had basically undergone an audit and were feeling the pressure to do an evaluation um, to address some of the issues that had been raised in the audit. And um, as we got into the process with them, we really tried to use the facilitation process of act, adapt, interact, and react to help elevate the reasons why this group might want to do evaluation for their own purposes and their own uses, rather than just for the to res in response to the things that were raised in the audit. And so we walked through some of the different things that the pro were happening in the programs and tried to really understand the questions that the folks had about their own program and connected it back to some of the findings in the audit, but really tried to make this more of a process where they were, they were starting to come around to the fact that this evaluation could be for them, not just for this external body. And, and it took us you know, the whole day to really talk through some of these things and think about examples of where you know, they had their own questions about what they were doing and came out with, um, a, you know, started to talk about methods at the end of the day once we really got into the things, the issues that were important. But it was really, we didn't go in with a preset plan where we, we just kind of said, here's what you're gonna do. And we talked through the different options. It was really more of a conversation with these with this group about how they were really feeling about this audit. Clearly there were a lot of feelings in this. And we also had gone in with some um, interviews beforehand to really understand some of the different issues that we were likely to face so that we could, we could um, anticipate some of them, but also needing, knowing that we were gonna need to be nimble during the process to really think through how we could engage the folks at the different places they were at. What do these uh, pictures represent, Charmaine? This is just, uh, I didn't wanna tell them what the specific agency was, but this is, <laughs> these are pictures of some of the different like types of work they did. So it was sort of a vague, I was trying to find a good graphic. <laughs> so don't, don't take too much from these pictures, unless you, you know, see something meaningful in them that I didn't, <laughs> didn't intend. Do you have any other examples or want to talk about that one? Um, I, uh, yeah, let, let me share my screen and share an example yeah. um, that uh, I just was involved in here. Um, So this is a, a, an article that from the Harvard Business Review that uh, was addressing the increased interest in big data and how having big data might affect decision-making in organizations. And what uh, these authors did was they were able to take a, a sample of 50,000 employees in uh, over 500 different private sector organizations and administer to them um, an instrument about how they viewed the relationship between data and decisions. Um, and they came up with three categories of people. One category they called unquestioning empiricists who trust analysis over judgment. That is, they just want to get the facts but they're 
uh, reluctant to deal with the interpretation of the facts. A second group they called visceral decision makers who just trust their gut over data. And then the third category of people, they labeled informed skeptics. These were employees they determined were best equipped to make good decisions, effectively balanced judgment and analysis, possess strong analytic skills, and listens to others' opinions, but willing to dissent. They described them as a kind of data savvy workers every company or program should try to cultivate. And in their data, they found that 38% uh, of employees and 50% of senior managers fit this category of informed skeptics. These would be uh, the people we would think of as prime evaluation users. 19% were visceral decision makers who didn't really trust analysis, and 43% were unquestioning empiricists, meaning that they thought that the data itself was simply going to answer their questions and they weren't going to have to make interpretations um, and judgments. And so in the active, reactive, interactive, adaptive piece of this, it's uh, preparing people to engage with the data rather than just receive it. Part of what I take away from this is that the, the what they call the unquestioning empiricists aren't thinking they're gonna to have to engage the data, that the data are going to give them the answers. And the article concludes uh, with a really, I think, Im impressive mantra for evaluation. The last paragraph of this article says, Big data, no matter how comprehensive or well analyzed, needs to be complemented by big judgment. Um, and so the big judgment is the active, interactive process of making sense of data uh, and reminding people data doesn't speak for itself. It ends up having to be interpreted, whether it's big data or small data. Uh, that and, and so, uh, the way I've, I use something like this is in the middle of an evaluation where maybe you're waiting for the data to come in and you want to prepare people for the interpretation is to show them uh, an article like this and have people um, self-rate themselves on how they view their own, which category they put themselves in, which category they put other people in their organization in. And it's a way to introduce the importance of interpretation and ultimately judgment in evaluation in a safe space before getting into the actual data that you're going to, to analyze with them. So it's another way, finding ways to engage people doesn't necessarily always just mean with the immediate evaluation at hand. Look for other things to bring in that will allow some safe discussion of the issues that you're going to face. Um, examples of bad questions that can't be answered empirically, um, the, uh, that people will, will be able to discuss, um, or poor interpretations of data. Um, we've got lots of examples of all that from the pandemic and from climate change. So it's a way of helping folks understand the bigger picture that's involved uh, in uh, the particular evaluation that's going on. As you're listening, please feel free to drop questions in the chat. We've got a few more slides about evaluation facilitation. And these next, this next slide will be familiar to those of you who've read Michael's book on facilitating evaluation. There are five evaluation facilitation principles that he presents in the book. So I'm going to show the slide. And do you want to talk through them as we go? Yeah, we'll do it quickly so we have time to interact. So be guided by the personal factor. You're, you're not sharing. Oh, I'm yet. not sharing anymore. Sorry, everybody. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. I'm seeing it now. All right. Yeah. So the the personal factor is is um, where you're not only you're getting to know the people involved, but where they're getting to know you. And one of the things that, that um, 
position that we've taken that is actually quite controversial in evaluation um, is that evaluators have skin in the game, that we have a stake in every evaluation. Um, and so being guided by the personal factor, I find in engaging uh, primary intended users that they really appreciate knowing what brings me to this work. Why do I care about whether or not they're going to use the data? And obviously we care about it because we care about use and our professional commitment to that and, and the basis of evaluations contribution to a, a better world, but also the uh, whatever the, the subject matter is. Uh, if it's youth homelessness, what brings you to that? If it's, if it's uh, equity issues, poverty issues, climate issues, that, that you become a person um, to the people that you're working with and not just a methodologist um, and that they become people, um, not just a decision maker for the evaluation. So that the personal factor becomes interpersonal in the active, reactive, adaptive process. And that means sharing uh, who you are, um, acknowledging, um, obviously, uh, I would acknowledge that I'm a, a older white male, and I have stories and jokes about that to engage my identity and, and uh, Charmaine being in the business and ha having grandchildren when I'm dealing with climate change and, and the future of the world. That, that's the, that personal factor makes evaluation personal and interpersonal. The options uh, is one of the critical things that, that makes this process manageable. You can't provide people with an overwhelming number of options. You can't ask them to generate the options. The evaluator's job is to generate uh, the options. And here again, you've heard us say that in, in previous sessions, the, the most controversial engagement part of utilization-focused evaluation is engaging primary intended users and methods decisions. It's become widespread now to engage stakeholders in determining priority evaluation purposes and questions. But most evaluators then figure once the questions have been identified, they're the methodological experts and they ought to design the evaluation. But utilization focused evaluation includes engaging in methods decisions and interpretation. And ordinary people, um, not, uh, not PhDs with methods, anybody can understand the difference between a survey and an open-ended interview. Um, they can understand the, the difference between um, uh, midpoints on a questionnaire and not having midpoints on a questionnaire. Uh, they can understand uh, the ways in which longer and shorter interviews are done or what a case study uh, is. And so presenting them with limited number of concrete options that are meaningful is how you get to quality um, and have them be buy-in, but not feel overwhelmed. A big part of what you have to do is to help figure out what are the key options to provide to people to make decisions about. Observe, interpret, and adapt means that, that you're constantly watching for how things are going. And not ignoring that. When you see that people aren't engaged or they're rolling their eyes or they look confused or, or look anxious, uh, stop and acknowledge that. Um, make use of, of the feedback that you're getting from people's body language or from the questions that they're asking. Um, don't just get into following your agenda and time schedule and we've got so much to cover that you don't observe. Uh, when, when things seem to be going well, you want to acknowledge that. When things aren't going so well, you want to acknowledge that and take time to figure out what to do. And I found that more difficult to do virtually when you're doing virtual facilitation than in person. And so that's a whole another set of skills. And I know there's a lot more trainings and things being developed for folks doing virtual facilitation. There are ways to kind of take the temperature of the Zoom call and things like that. But um, just acknowledging that it is a different 
different process online often. Well, we've talked about this a good bit, uh, embedding evaluative thinking throughout, showing people where you're actually um, helping them think evaluatively and how whatever decision you're making in the moment has larger implication when you look at, at things that are difficult to, to measure. I was just with a, a group last week where we were talking about some um, challenging things to, to measure and one of the examples we used was the way in which data about the incidence and incidence and prevalence of COVID has changed uh, because there's now so many home tests and because people are getting COVID with milder symptoms that aren't getting recorded. And so when uh, COVID was largely identified through going someplace and actually getting tested, there were generalizable data about how many people had COVID but the data have changed um, and the difficulty of monitoring those data have changed. So the uh, looking for larger examples to help people think about what their particular issue is, is one of the ways you teach evaluative thinking. And invigorate with leading edge inputs is looking at whatever new ideas or, or issues are emerging that you can bring to the group to help them feel up to date. So an example in our work, uh, in the, the fifth edition, we talk a good bit about sustainability, the climate emergency, uh, equity issues. But just in the last year, a new term has emerged that's not in the book, um, but I think you're gonna hear a lot more about, and that's polycrisis. Polycrisis, P O L Y crisis. Polycrisis is multiple intersecting crises. Uh, I was invited a month ago to be a part of a major conference on the polycrisis with uh, experts in various fields coming together. That means uh, climate, uh, health, pandemic, food insecurity and hunger, cyber terrorism, war, uh, pollution. Um, acidification of oceans, corruption, um, totalitarianism, uh, disinformation and social media. The, these, each of these is a crisis by itself, uh, is a emergency in some ways by itself as the trends show. And the poly crisis is the intersection in ways that these things affect each other. So, when I'm working now with, with groups, part of what I'll look at is where does the particular thing they're dealing with fit within a poly crisis format? That's invigorating the discussion with leading edge inputs. The, uh, the mascot for utilization focused evaluation facilitation is called a brittle star. Brittle star is a small uh, sea, sea uh, animal that uh, not a starfish or an octopus, it has five tentacles. And at any one time, it moves by putting one tentacle in front and flapping the other tentacles. But it can also change course very, very quickly from one tentacle to another. And so that's the dynamic part of facilitation is needing to change course um, quickly, but at any given time, you're leading with one of the evaluation principles, facilitation principles. So we leave you with this uh, advice, facilitate the participants in evaluation can do it, ask them, really, you know, have faith that people can do this, this work. Um, if they have a guide who's adaptive, interactive, reactive, um active and so um want to turn now to your questions and takeaways and comments um i saw a question in the chat about strategies for engaging these different types of end users the skeptics <clears throat> um those who tend to believe the data at base value and those who really rely more on their gut um so if you want to start with that question then we can invite folks to add others as they Think of them. Yeah. Um, the 
the ways in which the different people uh, uh, approach evidence is, is clearly a large societal issue for us um, around issues like vaccination, um, what kind of information to believe and not believe about, about food, about medical care, the disinformation that's out there. And, and so um, one of the things that, that I'll do is uh, to try to get away from first dealing with whatever topic we're dealing with is one of the exercises we use in the initial workshop um, that is that we do to help identify questions and purpose of the evaluation and get people to know each other is to uh, I like to have people in small groups if they're face to face or even on Zoom identify uh, a decision they've made recently and talk about how they made that decision um, whether it's renting a new apartment. Um, buying something, buying a car, buying an appliance, um, where to put their child in daycare, uh, a school decision, a parenting decision, a relationship decision, and um, to get people into examples uh, of how they make decisions, what evidence they brought to bear, what influenced their decisions, and to open up decision-making um, and evidence and ultimately the judgments that are a part of that on things that are safe. So in Minnesota, for example, we are in the state where the last glacier melted. And so there are lakes and rivers everywhere here. And it's the state motto is a land of 10,000 lakes. And as you might suspect, uh, a large proportion of the population by the latest data, 87% of the resident population goes fishing at least once a year. So if I'm working in Minnesota, I don't begin by talking about the particular program evaluation we're going to do. I begin by talking people with people about fishing. How's the fishing going? What constitutes a good day fishing? And say that everything that's in fishing is involved in evaluation. Is it the number of fish, the type of fish? Do you eat the fish? Is it catch and release? Who do you fish with? How do you decide what a good day fishing is. And that, that that logic process, judgment and data process, then can be applied to other things. So it's looking for safe places to get people into using data and interpreting um, and going beyond their gut instinct or the resistance to judgment uh, so that that can be applied to other questions. See a question from Carmen about the struggle of evaluation, and it's a it's a really is a hard thing to learn, I think, from a course or from a um, book. You can get tips and things like that, but for me, the best way to learn has really been to co-facilitate. You find someone, you know, if you were to go to a AEA or another conference and and see someone who you thought was really amazing even approaching them and asking if they you know you could if they would be willing to have you co-facilitate or mentor you um you know I'm lucky to have Michael who I have learned a lot from but I'm not him and I have my own style as well and so um thinking about you know really understanding where your strengths are and where your challenges are and either trying to find a co-facilitator who maybe has the strengths where you struggle or to really try to develop those by finding someone else who is great at them, who could mentor you, you could watch them, shadow them, those, I think it's really a learning as doing um, more than anything. Uh, you can only read and listen so much before you have to just get in there and make mistakes and figure out kind of where you need more support. That's my thought. You have other thoughts, Michael? Um. I, I do think that one of the things we don't do well is after action reviews, mm -hmm. the reflective practice. Uh, e even if you can't co-facilitate, uh, have somebody who can talk about the experience, review it, tell them what happened. You know, this is how therapists are trained. They have somebody who they go over cases with and give them advice or uh, even to talk about it. Well, 
we, we move from one evaluation to another without really doing the after action review, without reflecting. And the, the valuable part of writing books, as Charmaine and I are doing, is that it forces you to look for examples and do those kinds of after action reviews. What did I do? How did people respond? What might I have said um, to a particular situation? What example might I have used? Asking people for, for help in those uh, things. And um, the, the mantra that has helped me in having comfort with how a process is going is that it's all data. Whatever happens is data about what's going on. So that it's, it's actually, you know, I've got 50 years of experience with this, but when I'm working with groups, what happens is very often different than what I think is going to happen. Uh, every group is different. They're different political dynamics, diversity dynamics. And so what I've learned to do is to acknowledge that with the group and, and ask them what's going on for them. Uh, I remember having a group that I was, uh, had a frame for what the evaluation was going to be and participatory. And I asked them to, to begin listing questions that they might be interested in. And nobody would give me any questions. And I turned around and, and I, I said, don't you people have any questions? And they, I, it was all very evasive. So I just stopped and I said, what's going on? And they said, look, we are required to come to this thing because the mandated evaluation, we don't want to be here. It's on a Friday afternoon. We just want you to get through this, get on with it so we can leave. And I didn't know they had all been mandated and they didn't want to be there. So that became a really important issue for us to talk about. Uh, I thought these were folks who were interested. So use whatever's going on, get feedback from them, and then build on that. So James's question leads right into that. What did you do? How do you get the people who are mandated to care? I, I said, um, I, 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 I want you to leave right now. We're not going to continue. You don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Uh, so go out and do whatever you're going to do. And they started saying, no, 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 no. We're, we've been told we're to better. No, no. I said, I'm not. I'm done. You don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. And they started saying, well, we could do this. We could do this. It's a kind of reverse psychology. I didn't try to convince them that they ought to do something useful. I bought into what they were saying. Be out of here. Be gone. Go. And I was very resistant to continue to work with them until I said, well, now it's on you. You told me you didn't want to be here. Now you're telling me you do want to be here. Uh, what do you want to do? Uh, I said, I'm prepared to call the people who sent you here and told them they're screwing up the whole process. Why don't we develop a statement that I'll take to them and tell them why they can't behave this way? They said, no, 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 don't do that. So it's playing with the dynamics of it, sort of feeding back to people what they're saying, sometimes using reverse psychology. Um, but what I never want to do is be in a position of trying to convince people of doing something they don't want to do. They don't want to do it. I take them full tilt on it and say, all right, it's over. Let's not do it. Chalk this one up as not, as not useful. And then that helps get them in the way. I didn't mean to go that far. Uh, and that's one of the dynamics I found helpful. I'm not going to be in a position of trying to convince people to do something they don't want to do. All right. Well, thank you again for everybody, for everyone for being here. Um, just a reminder that you can follow Michael on YouTube for videos. Are you still, still going strong with that? I just put one out about 9-11, um, right. the rigor attribute model, the eight lessons about rigor from 9-11 that um, um, came out of the failed intelligence, the, the rock having no weapons of mass destruction and what the, the intelligence community learned about how to actually uh, do good data relates to Stan's question about dealing with politicalization um, and disinformation. The rigor attribute model is a great example of what it, of introducing to people the high stakes that come from, from only following politics and not following the evidence. And we're still living through that disaster today.
I will send out the slides and the recording to anyone who registered, and we hope to see you here next month in October, the third Wednesday of the month. And feel free to shoot us your questions in advance or things that pop up for you in the meantime. And thank you again. Go off and have a Still great. Still the best. Still the best. <laughs> bye bye. I Sam. tell you, my, Michael, I don't know.